Welcome everybody to episode one of Game Retail Ramblings. My name is Travis Severance. I'm coming from Millennium Game Studios today in tropical Rochester, New York. We're going to do a show that's a little bit about just my experience as a game store owner in this industry. To give you a little background on myself, I'm currently the co-owner of Millennium Games in Rochester, New York, the largest game store in the country. We're a little over 28,000 square feet. Our play space fits about 300 card players. I'm also the co-owner of Gaming Days LLC, which is best known for Free RPG Day. I'm also the co-designer of Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught Miniatures from WizKids. Uh, I'm the co-owner of Lightbreaker Studios, which is best known for the Overlay RPG. Uh, I wrote the foreword to the Friendly Local Game Store, which is pretty much the only book in our industry that gives you a walkthrough guide on how to have a middle income for running a game store. That's by Gary Ray. All of those things will be in the show notes below. And I know that's a lot of co, and I think I get carried by some really great people. So I'm going to branch out on my own. Who knows? If it's not good enough, I'll get a co-host at some point. And I also do TCS Consultation, which is a new endeavor. I had worked with a lot of publishers and retailers and distributors over the years um, and gave my time freely. And now I'm, I'm looking to make a couple of dollars doing that as well. Briefly to speak on that a little bit, some of the companies that I'll talk about on this show are going to be companies that I've done consultation work with. None of them thus far have this show obviously written into those contracts. Should there be a time when they pay me to talk about their stuff specifically, I'll make sure that I put that paid advertising thing up in the side so that you know if I'm being paid to tell you what I'm telling you. I'm pretty much just going to basically talk on my experience. And today I'm going to talk about the Altered TCG by Equinox, which is a new company out of France run by Régis Bonset. He is the former owner of Libelude. Um, if you have some familiarity with their board games, very, very successful. Dixit, Mysterium, Seasons, uh, Obscurio. Just a lot of really, really good quality stuff. The interesting part about that studio is a lot of times you'll see a studio get successful and they'll kind of ride the same train. Now, that's not to say that there aren't thousands and thousands of Dixit cards out there. But if you look at those diff those games, A, the artwork is compelling, and B, the mechanism behind them is completely different. So there's a lot of diversity as far as the product goes. We've sold lots and lots and lots of copies of those. So that's a large part of why I'm so compelled about this project to begin with. Uh, so if I take this back a little bit, I was reached out to by a team over at Asmodee, and they said, we'd like you to take a look at a company at Gen Con uh, over at Lucas Oil Stadium. They are a new CCG company. And that kind of takes me back and I pause a little bit because there's a lot of TCGs that start up and they're not that successful. They don't have a good game plan. Just for whatever reason, they, they don't get off the ground. I see a lot of them. There's a lot of emails that come in. A lot of people reach out to me. Hey, would you take a look at this? Would you take a look at this? And then obviously with crowdfunding, we've seen more of that. Some successful, some not so successful. So. I was compelled, so of course I'll, I'll take a meeting. Asmodee's never put anything in front of me that wasn't interesting before. So I walked into the room, and it was a room full of people that I never met, which is strange for me because I know a lot of the people on that team, with the exception of Colton Carpenter. I didn't know anybody in the room. So that was interesting. We were shown a slide, just sort of introducing ourselves to the world. And then myself and my, my good friend Paul Butler sat down, and, and we started playing right away. The game was familiar, but compelling. There were some zones of play that were different that I hadn't seen before. The artwork was fantastic. There were two sort of zones of influence that we were playing on, and it was nice. It was, it was going back and forth. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the type of TCG where it's my turn, and I do all my stuff, and then it's your turn, and you do all your stuff. You, you actually go back and forth during the game, which isn't every, every card game out there. So we got through the game, had a great time, and I noticed in the bottom part of the card was a QR code. So when I got up, I initially said, is there a digital app that goes with this? <laughs> and they said, well, we'll get, we'll get into it with the, with the presentation. So they brought up a bunch of slides and they started talking about the game and they led with the technology. And part of the technology is this, this QR code down in the bottom that speaks specifically about being able to scan cards into your collection. And the first thing that they talked about with that was print on demand. So, Every single card that you have in Altered has the opportunity to do print-on-demand should you desire that. So what happens is counterfeiting comes out, of, comes out of play. It's a big problem that we deal with right now. I've seen counterfeit cards from 
Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic, to, to name a few, but those are the most, most rampant ones. We deal with loss from counterfeit constantly and customer service issues and different things like that, just based on the, the sheer volume of counterfeit cards that are in the market today. So this print-on-demand thing, when you scan your QR code, any player is going to have access to the cards immediately in their collection, and that's how they're allowed to play in a tournament. They have, a, they have an electronic QR code that says that they own that card, and that card is also something that's in their digital collection that they're allowed to sell on their digital marketplace as well. So I had to back up a little bit, and I said, digital marketplace, you're building a digital marketplace into the app. They said, yes. So part of their digital marketplace is if you want any card you want, you can sell in their digital marketplace. There's a 5% fee that goes with that that goes to them, which was brilliant. It's significantly lower than any of the digital marketplaces that I'm selling on currently. And what happens is it doesn't matter what language the card is in. You just transfer that electronic ownership of that code to somebody else and they have access to that card immediately. Then they're allowed to print that card if they'd like and the card becomes theirs. They can print as many copies as they like. It doesn't matter. You're allowed to play it in a tournament and they own that. From an ownership standpoint, we can print out 100 copies of a rare and instead of owning the physical electronic code, we could buy that off the marketplace and then sell that to customers immediately. So there's, there's no, that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist in our industry. We've had a handful of people that have gone down the road of physical digital. The closest that I've seen to this is Warhammer Champions. We did well with that game out of the gates and then they kind of fumbled themselves. So I've got digital integration. I've got a deck builder. I've got tournament results. I've got electronic ownership of a card. And it's going to be done in a way where the fees for selling that are lower than what I'm dealing with on any market space at the time. And I don't have to ship the card anymore. So what happened as I went through this presentation was every single time I had a question, the team politely said, wait for the next slide. And the next slide would pop up and they would answer the question that I had. So I left the meeting energized. I left the meeting compelled. I left the meeting really intrigued. So as we were walking back from Lucas Oil to the main floor, what was interesting was and Paul and I were excited about the opportunity, but honestly, all we did was talk about the game. We got to see two of the six factions. That was it. We went through the plays in our head. We started putting together some of the mechanics and things like that. The digital stuff, the print on demand was all exciting and that was different. And let's see what the application of that looks like. But it was really the game that sort of turned us on to the whole thing. So fast forward to September 16th, Paul has hosted a, a play test week for the designers that have come over to his store to get some feedback for, for the game in general, to understand the mechanics of things. And I fly down there to check it out. Well, I fly down there with a whole bunch of people from my, from my local community as well they are excited about the game. So we've all either gotten a car or gotten a plane to go down to Baltimore to check this thing out. We go there, we play the game for two days straight, a bunch of different decks, a bunch of different ideas. The, the designers that were there were, were amazing. They answered a whole ton of questions. We got to meet with David who handles some of their back end stuff because I was super compelled about that as well. And there's pretty good provenance as far as where the team come from and what the, comes from and what the team has done before. So there's some big names behind where some of these people have come from Super impressed again, really want to know more about the game. I got to leave with some demo decks. I came back and the demo decks that we played that were just sort of print on demand versions of the game were a huge hit at the, the employee Christmas party that we had. And then fast forward another, another month or so, and I get invited out to Paris on January 27th to do their Kickstarter launch. So Paul and I hop in a plane, we head over there, get to meet the team that we don't know that's over there, the other team that we did know some other influencers from the area get to get to meet some store owners and different people like that the kickstarter launch goes over 10,000 followers so at this point i'm you know 4500 miles of travel logged into this game and i haven't sold a single pack yet to circle back to gen con briefly when publishers bring me in to take a look at stuff oftentimes what they want is a really blunt honest direct opinion I don't have any other opinions. They're all pretty blunt, they're pretty honest, they're pretty straightforward, and you either love it or you hate it, and, and, that, and that's okay. So when I talked with some of the team that allowed me to, to be part of, those, part of those meetings, I would say that they were curious to know what I had to say, 
a little hesitant. The the team themselves were were launching Star Wars Unlimited at the time, so that was sort of the the prettiest girl at the ball for them. There was a lot of demos downstairs. There were people that were really active. You know, Lorcana had kind of taken over the convention in general, but my feedback was pretty strong. And I think when they got some feedback from people outside of the organization, they felt a lot more confident about the project and they were ready to kind of put the, their foot on the gas when it came to that sort of thing. So from there, I interacted with them back and forth as far as some concerns that I had. There were some thoughts on how they were going to distribute the game, how they were going to put the game out. The Controlling a collectible is really hard to do. A lot of times people don't get it right, so there's overproduction, underproduction, that sort of thing. They can't meet demand, they're over demand, there's not a lot of value in it. One of the things that I sort of pride myself on is investing in collectibles that make money. I've got 42, 43 employees at this point. I've got a large community. They rely on me to be able to pick winners. And historically, I've done a really good job of, of being able to find stuff that's maybe a little innovative or a little bit different where people are hesitant to want to put their money in it until it's proven. And what I would say to that is that hesitancy a lot of times ends up costing money in the end. So when Dice Masters came out from WizKids, we took a really large buying position for that and that sold out and it made a whole ton of money. When Star Wars Destiny came out, the same thing. We took a large position on that. We made a whole bunch of money on that. When Keyforge came out, we took a large position on that. We made a whole bunch of money on that. And a lot of that has to do with either people at the retail level or at e-commerce level, just hesitant to buy into something that's new, something that's different, not understanding the mechanism of it. It's very easy to continue to order Magic and Pokemon and that stuff's gonna sell reasonably well. And it's, it's easy to do. You don't have to do a lot of extra work outside of just managing the community that you have and trying to recruit more. This is the type of game that fits into the same category. It's, it's not like anything that's on the market right now. I think it puts a lot of downward pressure on the games that are in the market as far as the marketplace goes, as far as counterfeits go, as far as, I mean, the artwork is gorgeous. Not that we don't have other games out there with gorgeous artwork, but the artwork is really, really solid for the game as well. But in general, what I'm going to talk about on each episode is, is, is what I'm doing and what's worked for me and what hasn't worked for me. I'm not going to sit here and say you should do or I think that you should or make suggestions or take advice. I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing here. So episodes are going to be different. We're going to have a whole ton of different topics on a on whatever it is that I that I think is relevant at the time or that I just happen to be dealing with on a Wednesday morning. So part of that is I'm going to do a top 7 so the top seven reasons why the altered TCG project is compelling to me. Uh, number seven is there's no IP. They are building it out on their own. So they don't have a licensor that they're dealing with. They don't have any constraints as far as that goes. There aren't royalties that they're paying out. There's nobody that they have to get their artwork approval from. I know internally they're dealing with a lot of diverse topics and different things like that. So they do have somebody that's uh, that looks at the content in terms of making sure that the content is good content to put out. But in general, they're not attached to anything. So there's pluses and minuses to that. They, you know, they don't have something like Star Wars or Game of Thrones or My Hero Academia or anything like that where they can sort of have a built-in fan base that's curious about what they're doing in that universe. But even when you do have that, there's pluses and minuses to that because some of those baked in fans are going to come in and they're either going to like the experience or they're not going to like the experience. So the lore that they're fleshing out, the story that they're telling with these characters is compelling. Number six is the artwork. The artwork for Libelud stuff is some of the best in the industry. The artwork for this game in general is amazing. The idea that as rarity goes up on cards, the artwork changes, the artwork gets a little better, it's a little more compelling, is very neat. It's a cool part of this game that nobody else does. There are other games that have, you know, the same card that functions at a different playability and things like that with flesh and blood, but the artwork is the same. The digital marketplace being 5% is super compelling to me. The places that we're selling now, primarily TCG Player, Amazon, and eBay, 
all take significantly more than that. And then on top of that as well, we have shipping that we deal with. Well, you're not shipping anything on that digital marketplace. Now, if you're a traditional store and you don't want to deal with that, of course you can hand sell anytime you want. You can trade anytime you want the way that you can. You just need to have your phone in order to be able to change your digital, your digital code and allow somebody else to have that. So dealing with a marketplace that's 5% and I'm paying the 5% towards the person that's directly impacted by that revenue and that data that they get from those sales is something that I enjoy because it puts a standard in place that says we want our user experience and our seller experience there to be super, super smooth and it impacts our back pocket if we don't. So I think when it comes to things that they run into or issues that they have in the marketplace, they're invested as much as I am to make sure that works. You could say the same about the others, but they also have the product behind it. So they're, they're sort of taking on the same the same sort of position, the same sort of concerns that, that I have as a seller on the marketplace. And I think their reaction is, is going to be faster than some of what I've seen in some of the other platforms. Print on demand is, is amazing. I mentioned it a couple of different times. We're going to see how this functions. My thought is when a new set comes out, it's going to take longer to get your cards as the sets more seasoned. I would say that it's probably going to be shorter just based on the curvature of what the popularity of a new set is, how much training is going on. And then I would say the same about times before large OP events. So if there's a you know a regional event or something big like that coming out in a week, I would say you'll see sales that'll spike there. It may take you a little bit longer to get your print on demand. And part of that is just we'll see how the we'll see how the company is that they're interfacing on that and what they can get done there. That said, right now, unless you're buying from a physical store, you're waiting for shipping anyway. You're waiting for somebody to pack something into an envelope. You're waiting for them to throw it out and send it to you. Along with that print on demand too, they don't have any foil cards, but they'll ha allow you the ability to foil your cards and be able to print out foils based on what they put in their packs as well. There's a whole ton of information on all of the stuff that they put out. I would welcome you to take a look at their, their Kickstarter pledge. Currently they're at 62.23 for backers, 2.27 million dollars in revenue generated, which puts them at the second highest Kickstarter for a TCG ever. It comes out to about 339 dollars per pledge. So if you look at what a player is buying, a person that's pledging, that puts you around two booster boxes and some starters. That to me is proof of the potential market. So number three on my list is potential market and profit. So if you look at the CCGs that have released in the last five years, you take a look at anything from Bandai, um, the first set sells really well. Battle Spirits sort of being the exception. Battle Spirits is something that I took a pretty sizable position on. The first set I got out from underneath, the second set I didn't because I didn't push back on what I ordered from the, from the second set with my distributor because I just don't walk on the stuff that I order. So I took a bath on that, and part of that was just the way they managed the they managed that game in general. I didn't think the Las Vegas event was a good idea. Some of the things that they did post my pre-order ability were different. That said, we had a we had a small community for that game. Everything else, though, first set does really really well. How they handle the second set is usually a train wreck. A lot of times, the second set goes down because they overprint because the demand is has all gobbled up and there's nothing left and they've decided what they're going to do is order a ton because a lot of people were screaming and they don't know how to armor up on something like that. So the second set a lot of times is sort of a nightmare. And you, if you follow TCG's TCG market, you can see a lot of that overprinting that occurs. And sometimes it, it just submarines an entire game. So first set though, look back at all the Bandai games. You're going to make decent money on that. I made, I made good money on that thing. When I'm looking at this game, no matter what, it's gonna have enough legs to get a couple of years in. I think a lot of times I've watched or I've seen or I've read where retailers have trepidation about getting into something new. Well, how long is it gonna be around? You know, what, what, can, I, what can I do? I have to sell this to my community and, and so on and so forth. I sort of let them make their own buying decisions. If I realistically look at longevity in our marketplace, I don't know. There's thousands of TCGs that have come out thus far. The ones that have only that have stood the test of time are Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, and UVS. Uh, nothing else out there on the market has more than 10 years in a collectible capacity. 
that survive. So realistically, you're probably only looking at three to five years on a TCG in general. Taking the money from that first year is super important for us, building that community and then seeing how the publisher decides to handle their events and expansion sort of dictates what we're going to do as far as investment goes on the rest of the, on the, rest of the game in general. So number th- two is diversity inclusion. So if you take a look at this game and you look at their artwork and you look at the characters and the world and all that thing, they are trying to make sure that the game is built for every type of player, every, every player that exists out there. I, I really appreciate their take on who they have as their characters, what the world is like. There's definitely some social conflict going on that will feel familiar to us that you can see. Yoshi, the person that's handling the lore, has done a really good job painting with a really nice canvas, and, and the, the lore so far is pretty amazing. I know early on they talked about having a lore button for every card that was going to explain to you sort of a story about that card and what's going on, so I think that's still part of what they're planning on doing. So if you're, if you're unfamiliar with the lore and you haven't followed the Kickstarter, feel free to dive into that. There was an AMA on that as well as well as an AMA by Eric, the chief marketing officer. He just covered that for fans a little while ago. I know they're going to be at Gamma in a capacity so to have some conversations with some retailers to be able to show the game. It'll be shortly after the Kickstarter ends, but I've been told that they'll have the ability for retailers to still participate after the, um, after the Kickstarter is over as well, because Gamma's like a week after that ends. I know I'm taking a large position on this. This will be the biggest position that, I, that I've taken at the end on any card game set ever. Based on the numbers that I'm looking at right now, it's larger than any Magic set that I've ever ordered. It's larger than any Pokemon set that I've ever ordered. It's more money invested into one single card game than we've ever done in business. So the last thing that I'm excited about is the gameplay. Honestly, the, the gameplay is sort of getting thrown out the window because I've seen a lot of conversation about the print on demand end of it, the QR code, the the marketplace, all of that is new and different and exciting. But if you haven't had a chance to get on and play the game, I would encourage you to do that. They've got print on demand. They had a they had an entire week where there was a promotion up where Board Game Arena lets you run demos for a week. You can find their digital app that's not official, but it's called X Altered. Really, really easy install that has the demo decks. You can build your own decks as well and go from there. So. If you want to try the game out, I would encourage you to try the game out and play it. I would put it in front of as many communities as you can to take a look at the game because the game plays really, really well. And that's that's my top seven. As far as what's going on here, this weekend we have Star Wars Unlimited Premier Preview. That's at 4 p.m. on Saturday. I have some folks from Asmodee coming in. We're lucky enough to have visit the store. That's going to be a fun event. And I look forward to our next episode, 9.30 a.m. Wednesday next week. And we'll have a brand new topic. I appreciate everybody that stopped by. As always, you know, smash the like, follow all of that good stuff. Work on the algorithms. If you don't catch this, we'll be up on YouTube. You can find us on YouTube and it'll be pushed out on podcast as well. Thanks for everybody for joining. Apologies for not getting to the comments. Next time I'll back up a little bit and I'll answer those for you.